Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Psychology for Sport. I'm Steve Saffel and if you haven't already, click on the subscribe button. Anyway, today what we're going to be doing is doing an overview of uh, psychology and personality. The assignment we're covering is assignment one and we're going to focus today on task one. Task one is all to do with personality and here we have a pass, a merit and a distinction, P1, M1 and D1 and below that is a list of things that we must describe, explain and evaluate. Okay, of course whenever we start any new assignment we have to start off with the key definitions so we might as well start off with what is personality. So personality, according to Weinberg and Gould, is, is the sum of the characteristics that make a person unique. And basically what that means is there's lots of different characteristics. If you Google characteristics of personality, there's long lists from selfless, likeable, fun, caring, shy, and so on. Uh, the list is endless. And basically everyone has a unique mixture of them and that's what makes them who they are. And that's what you need to do. I believe what I've asked you to do in lessons is uh, use this definition, find another definition, and then go to the higher order, which is assimilate our response. And if you can do that, then you are ready for university. So on that big list, the first thing that we need to talk about is Martin Schematic. Martin Schematic has three layers. The lower layer is the psychological core, the middle layer is the typical responses, and then on the top are the role-related behaviours. The psychological core is more to do with your natural personality. If you had no barriers, no nothing, if you're left on your own and all that lot, what would your personality be? This is often seen in young children. So when a young child kind of goes through the mind phase, this is very much the key element of a psychological core. But as we go older, we learn to behave and adhere to certain rules. And this is where our typical responses come in. So what we get, of course, is in any situation, any person will react in a different situation uh, with different traits showing. On the top, of course, are the role-related behaviours. And this is, okay, we have our psychological core, our, our kind of instinctive way of uh, developing our personality, got our typical responses, our more learned approach, and then role-related behaviours is how our personality might change for different situations. So, for example, you guys will react and act completely differently in a classroom with your mates, at home with friends and family and so on. And so how your personality changes. Now, if we interpret that in sports, of course, what that means is you might start the game all happy and hunky-dory. If you're 5-0 down, your personality might change. If you're 1-0 down with a, uh, one minute to go, your personality might change and you become more aggressive. And so it is seen a lot in sport how our personality will change down to uh, the, the kind of scenario that we are in. The activities we did in lesson, first of all, we did about me. And that was very much about uh, you telling me uh, or each other what drives you to kind of uh, be motivated to do things. And some of you were kind of uh, linked with friends and family, some with status, some very much to do with sport and pastime, some kind of academic and career driven. Everyone's different. And that is a good example of how the psychological core works. It's uh, the unconscious part of it. And when we kind of did that activity of favorite animal, that is more kind of how you want to be seen uh, with others. And so that is the, the typical behaviors that we see. And of course, the Tinder thing activity that we did, what that is showing is, of course, we do have various personalities for, for different things. So of course, uh, you would never put onto Tinder if you ever use that, um, what your real personality is. You kind of bump it up, make it perfect. And often that is seen in most social media. Your personality on social media is completely different to you in real life. What you need to do, first of all, for the P1 is define what personality is. So that definition will uh, do it really nicely. The second bullet point on the bottom there, Martin Schematic View, I would like you to draw a little triangle if you haven't already. And with that triangle, try and uh, describe and explain how, uh, how Martin Schematic works. And then, of course, the third one evaluates the effects of personality and performance. We'll kind of touch on that uh, right now. So... 
Martin schematic, you can look at it in lots of different ways. First of all, we can look at it internally and externally. And uh, when it comes to that, then when it comes to the psychological core, then that is very much developed internally. It's your own psych, your own point of view and everything that happens within your mind. It's the way your wires are in your brain and that is how it is. But as we move up the triangle, of course, your personality is de determined more by external factors like the situation, the environment that you're in, the people that you're interacting with and so on. So there's one way that you can evaluate uh, Martin's schematic. On the right hand side, of course, we've got uh, that flux between dynamic and constant. The dynamic element at the very top is, is ever changing. Like in the sports situation or the example I gave you just then, what you will get is your personality will always be changing depending on whether you're winning, losing, somebody's done a bad tackle on you, the opposition are being nice to you, the opposition are being aggressive to you and so on. Whereas with the psychological core, those core key beliefs that uh, you were born with, basically you're stuck with for the rest of your life according to Martin Schematic and all the other people that uh, developed it. So that's what you need to do first of all for Martin Schematic. You can stop this video, you can start doing a bit of research and hopefully you'll have a bit of work for you to do that. Uh, one thing that you can also do in the evaluation is talk about it's uh, whether it is re relevant to sports and yes it is to a point. Uh, it's great to kind of have a, an overview how, of how personality might work. Remember this is a model, it isn't this is this is how it works, it's just somebody's theory. Does it help you kind of improve a team? Not really, it just helps you understand how personalities operate. So that's Martin Schematic. Now onto the next one on the list, which is psychodynamic theory. Well, of course, there are a number of people that have developed this over the time, but one person that did a lot of work in it is uh, this guy called Freud. Sigmund Freud, decades ago, came up with a psychodynamic approach. He did a lot of psychoanalysis and he came up with this psychodynamic approach. And basically, there are three components to your personality. The first one being the instinctive drive, which is often just called your id. The second is your super ego. This is like the moral conscience uh, which balances the in instinctive drive, but I'll mention that in a second. And then in between is something called your ego. So if I did this in a diagram, of course, my way of uh, kind of interpreting this is uh, angels and demons. On one shoulder, you've got your angel. On the other shoulder, you've got your demon and they're battling it out for making decisions and choices that your overall personality will make. And of course, in between this is uh, your own ego. You make the choice. So three components here. Your id is uh, the instinctive drive. It's got that kind of selfish nature. It wants you to kind of do things just for your own views and your own gains and so on. Whereas this is balanced with the superego. Superego, yeah, we've called it the, the moral conscience. And basically what that is, is you're out there to be altruistic. You're there to help everyone else in the whole wide world. And of course, it's very hard to be very much driven by your id. It's very hard to be a super ego all the time. And so what we all naturally do, of course, is balance it. And that's us in the middle, the ego. It makes up the choices in between. Okay, if I did the id way, this is what might happen. If I went the super ego scenario way, then that will happen. And then in the end, you get the balance and that is uh, your overall ego. And that is basically what Freud said, the, how personality works according to the psychodynamic approach. Now, another part that you need to talk about with the psychodynamic approach is something known as the iceberg effect. I would recommend that you go and look that up on the internet or use some of the resources I've put on the Google Classroom. I have put textbooks on there and you can read them. So on the eye of uh, the iceberg theory, what you have is basically like any iceberg, like those great stories of ships like the Titanic floating along there. When you see an iceberg, you just see the small tip above the water. The majority of it is under the water. And what the iceberg theory is basically saying is that the majority of your personality is under the water in this kind of analogy. But under the water here means it is unconscious. So what it is saying is the majority of your personality is driven through unconscious thoughts and processes. Whereas on the top, in the tip of the iceberg, is your conscious, where you are able to kind of make those conscious choices as to how you do it. 
Now, if we look at the diagram here, of course, when it comes to your id, your instinctive drive, that is completely unconscious. There's no way that you normally choose the id and process it. It is just purely unconscious. It is always there. I don't know about you, but often when something happens in my head, my first reaction is quite negative. That is an unconscious thought. And then my conscience overtakes that. And I will just smile and say, that's nice. And that's how we do it. Uh, so, of course, when it comes to our alter ego to the id, the superego, the majority of that is uh, unconscious as well, with a little bit uh, that we choose. And sometimes we verbally express our superego as well when talking to other people. And of course, when it comes to making the, the choice in the end, your ego is the one that makes that choice. And a lot of that is in the conscious area. So what I would do is I'd recommend you start looking up what the iceberg theory is with regard to the psychodynamic approach. And then if you can do that and write about it, uh, describe, analyze and evaluate, then you'll be doing all right for the P's, M's and D's. Good luck with that. Okay, of course, this one here is a psychodynamic approach. And the big question, because it is sport that we're talking about, is can we use this to help assess athletes? Well, once again, a bit like Martin's theory, it's great to know and understand how people come to those choices. But in the end, it will not help you identify the strengths and weaknesses of somebody's personality and how you might approach a training program and alter it to meet the, their needs of their personalities and motivations. And so, yeah, it's great to have. But in the end, does it help us make better athletes? Not really. The next one on the list that you need to talk about is something called the trait approach. This person, Isenk, many decades ago, came up with it. And basically, he said, your personality is just made up of lots of different characteristics. And if you think about it, going back to the first slide, what is the definition of personality? Then this is very similar to, to that, which is basically you have your personality and it's just lots and lots of different traits or characteristics that will make your personality. And as I said beforehand, if you Googled characteristics of a personality, you get an endless list of different characteristics. And this is what uh, I think and other researchers kind of looked into. One thing that a lot of researchers did was, okay then, there's hundreds and hundreds of different traits and characteristics, but what are the key ones? What really make up the majority of your personality? And what we have here is work by uh, Gill and Williams about a decade ago. And what they did was they tried to look at what were the five key characteristics that will make up the majority of your personality. And they came up with this list here. So of course, on one end, what you get is you have a, a polar scale between are you neurotic or emotional? And of course, everyone will fall somewhere in between there, some more towards neuroticism some more towards being more stable and others slap bang in the middle so it's a sliding scale and the same for all the others out there so of course neurotic emotionally stable we've got uh, extroverts introverts we've got openness to experience some people just love a little bit of an adventure other people think oh no I'm stuck in my ways I like it how I know it so think about how you like your eggs and that is it basically agreeableness some people will just kind of say yeah yeah I'll just get on with whatever you say other people will argue the tosh and so that's that sliding scale and then conscientiousness do people are they self-minded and think about themselves or do they always think about that level of emotional intelligence which is what if I do this how will it affect other people and so that's how this scale works and the big thing about this compared to the two other models that we've just done is you can measure this and how do psychologists measure this? Well, funnily enough, they've invented something called the questionnaire. And what I'd like you to do now is if you go onto the Google Classroom, there's a questionnaire there called uh, the Big Five. What I've tried to do is find an online version, click on that, and what you can do is you can find your own characteristics, your own traits that make up your personality. I'll give you a few minutes, get on with that, press a pause, uh, well, Press the pause, then get on with it. When you've finished it and try to interpret it, come back to this and uh, we'll carry on. Okay, so you've done the questionnaire. You've got lots of different values for these big five. 
and hopefully we can work out where we are according to these scales. So of course, some of you will be classed as more neurotic, others more emotionally stable, extrovert, introverts, openness to experience, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. And what, of course, as we know, uh, the definition of personality is that it is a mixture of characteristics or traits that make you unique. So no doubt, when it comes to this, everyone will be different. So that kind of leads us to the next question, which is basically, if you had all these big five, what makes a perfect striker? Is it somebody that is neurotic? Is it somebody that is stable in those pressurized situations? Do you need an extroverted striker, an introverted striker, and so on? Can we make the perfect striker? Well, funnily enough, you can't. Every single striker has different traits and characteristics because there are no two people the same. What you need to do is, if you're the coach, of course, you need to appreciate where they're from, and that's how you engage with them. If you know they're neurotic, sometimes you need to kind of pull that neuroticism back into the middle and make them a bit st more stable to make them understand the situation. Of course, this will happen in more pressurized situations. If they're introverted or extroverted, it may change how you coach them and all that, or talk to them individually. And same when it comes to uh, training. Are they open to experience? Are they agreeing? Can you say, right, this is uh, the system that we're going to play? Or are they going to go, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do it my way and so on. So all these things do start to help the coach become a better coach by making the players better, by understanding how their personality might react to any given situation. Okay, the next thing that I'd like you to do is uh, there's another questionnaire. It's called the Profile of Mood States. It's another online thing. It's, pretty, it's a lot quicker and simpler than the other one, I believe. So all I need you to do is fill that out and you should get scores for tension, depression, anger, vigor, fatigue, and confusion. So if you press pause again now and then you go onto the Google website, the Google Classroom, and then on there is a link for the Profile of Mood States and then just have a go and see what you do that. And then come back and press play and we'll carry on. Thank you. So you've done your profile of mood states questionnaire. Now, of course, if you look at the scores, one of the things that you need to talk about is differences in personalities between elite athletes and non-athletes. And this is a good questionnaire where you can kind of quickly go over there and do it. So there has been a lot of research into profile of mood states. And basically what they have found is that if they did research on elite athletes for lots of different sports and events, then what we, they find is something called an iceberg profile. This is not the same as the iceberg theory for the psychodynamic theory, but it's more the profile of how the POMS looks for elite athletes. And what you get is uh, when they did it all, they did the average for a normal population with a large uh, sample size, and they've put that down as 50. So of course, if you're beneath 50, you got less less of that trait, for example, tension and depression and so on. And then if you're above 50, then of course, you're above the average uh, of the population. Now, when they did this questionnaire for hundreds of different elite athletes, what they found was that all but one of those characteristics were beneath the average. So tension, depression, anger, fatigue, and confusion were lower than the average population. But when it came to vigor, that was significantly higher than the average population. So this is called the iceberg theory, where elite athletes have been shown to have certain personality traits that are different compared to the non-athletes. Now, the question is, of course, do you have the same personality traits as an elite athlete? The important thing to remember is that not all elite athletes are that. Some have different shapes and all that lot, but when it comes to the general population of elite athletes, then this is what they have found. So don't cry over these results thinking that you'll never be able to play for Man United ever again. Anyone can do that. And if so, next time, just do the question and cheat. There's another questionnaire for you to do. This one is called Type A and B Personalities. So we're going to stop it right there. And what I would like you to do is complete it and then come back in a bit. Thank you. Okay, so you've done the Type A and Type B Personality Test. And what you should do is you should either be uh, more towards Type A, Type B, or some of you may be balanced. 
So what does all this mean? Well, there's lots of different theories behind it. This all came about with a, a bunch of cardiologists and what they were trying to do is work out which people are more at risk of having a heart attack or, or any other heart condition. And what they found was people that were closer to type A would be more prone to chronic heart disease. And so what they did was uh, they've used this to help develop resources to minimize uh, the risks of it. However, uh, a lot of sports scientists have started looking into this and using this questionnaire, and they've found out some other interesting things. For example, one thing that you need to talk about is the differences between individual sports activities and team sports activities. And then what they found is that uh, people that are more type A seems to prefer exercising on their own. For example, going to the gym on their own, going for a run on their own, cycling on their own, and so on. Whereas type B are more team based. So it might be that they play team sports such as football, basketball, netball, and all that lot. It might be that they prefer gym classes, for example, Zumba, or boxer size, or pump, or spin, or whatever. So that's how this has been interpreted in in the sports circles as well. So there is a lot of differences between type A and B. I recommend that you do some research, but basically that that is how these traits have been used in sport. And hopefully, if you write about that as well, that meets the criteria, and then you're closer to be getting your distinctions as well. Summary of the trait approach that which is what we've just covered in all that. Firstly, the advantage of a trait approach, as you've now found out, is you can measure it. The majority of measurements is through a questionnaire. Of course, what you should be doing when you're doing these questionnaires is putting you in the scenario of what you want to be analyzing. So for example, consider yourself on the sports field and then uh, apply it to that. And hopefully you can get some more accurate results with that. Uh, one problem with it though, when it comes to the trait approach, it is very much internalized. It will only consider Consider what's happening within your mind. It does not consider what is happening on the outside of the world. And of course, as we've mentioned already, when it comes to things like Martin schematic, there is an external element when it comes to personality. How do we react to the environment that we are in? How do we react to the, the people that we play with or play against? And so the trait approach is pretty good, but it's not perfect. The next one is called the situational approach. This was developed by a lovely bloke called Bandura. In the 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s and 70s, he did lots of research that I think is slightly unethical, but in the end, interesting in a different kind of way. So this is more dark psychology. Uh, can you get away with it nowadays? I doubt it very much. But basically, when it comes to traits, it's all about those characteristics from within. This one here, when it comes to the situational approach, is... It's more to do with the environment that you are in. Of course, it's to do with social learning theory. Social learning theory is all to do with those interactions uh, with the environment and other people. This is summarizing this amazing diagram that somebody drew and uh, copied off the internet. And basically there's three elements to social learning theory. First of all, you've got the modeling. Anyone will pick up personality traits and elements through modeling. Or in other words, they'll pick up the skills of practice and the self-efficiency of others. They'll learn from others and think, yeah, if they're doing it and they're awesome, then that is great and I'll carry on doing that. And of course, there's lots of different ways that could happen. For example, you might watch uh, an elite sports athlete on the TV and you think I can see what they're doing I'm going to do that as well how many of us has watched match of a day watched a cracking goal and then gone down to the park to try and replicate that I know that was certainly me I'm sure it is for everyone else out there as well the second one is the innate personality is basically what knowledge, expectations and attitude that you and others have around you. So for example, is is your coach the most knowledgeable person in the world and uh, knows what to do in lots of different situations? Do the uh, and you agree those expectations of what is expected from yourself as well as the coach? And also the attitude. Does your coach always just call you a knob or, or are they always polite and nice to you? And of course, these things will rub off in different 
different personality ways. Uh, and so that's the innate person. And of course, the environment. The environment can include the social norms where it is more to do with the people around there. How do other people behave around you? And you guys are, uh, are pretty interesting when it comes to it. How has the environment affected your way of learning? Are you in a large group? Are you in a small group? If you're in a smaller group, would it have affected your personality in that group? And of course, all of us teach up in that uh, lovely learning environment called Borderville. And up there, of course, what we get is it's a pretty decent area. And uh, hopefully what we get is that affects your personality and wearing a badge, wearing uniform really affects your personality. And that's one thing that uh, a lot of companies out in the industry like. If you all wear uniform, it shows you, it affects your personality, hopefully in a positive way. So people will respect you, you will respect them, and it will make you a better person to get on and be productive and successful. So interactional approach is the next one. And basically that is, you've got the trait approach, characteristics, internal. You've got the situational approach, the environment and the other people that you interact with. Well, the interactional approach is very much, okay, let's stick them both together and see how it is. So of course it looks internally at what characteristics characteristics you have and then with those internal characteristics it will ask you those questions like if you got that characteristic what would happen if you put in with that bunch of people what happens if we put you in that scenario and that environment how will it affect you and that is very much the interactional approach so examples of questions like will extroverts perform better in a team situation and introverts in an individual or example, uh, we were talking about type, type A and B. Another one, will highly motivated people adhere to a formal exercise program longer than exercises with low motivation? So you can see in those two examples and the third one, it's very much asking questions about what traits do you have internally and what's the situation externally and then how do they mix and interact and as soon as we start thinking that you can see one big plus of this is it considers absolutely everything when it comes to personality internal external dynamic static and so on the big disadvantage is is it measurable to me it's only something that you learn through experience so only an experienced coach can do a, a whole interactional study of the athletes that they're in charge of and come up with the best solution for the kind of personalities that are there. So that to me is interactional approach. For task one, what you need to do is define personality. Uh, if you can do that, of course, to get the merits and distinctions, you then need to explain and evaluate the effects of personality on sports performance. So remember, talk about those theories that are on there, uh, Martin, psychodynamic traits, situational and interactional, and then kind of go into it uh, with uh, the strengths and weaknesses that I've talked about, what's good and bad about it, and then please always give sporting examples. And then hopefully uh, that will help uh, show that you can evaluate, which in other words means identifying strengths and weaknesses and uh, which one's best and which one's worse and so on. If you can do all that lot, then hopefully you'll be able to get the distinction. Any questions, uh, contact me on Google Hangouts or whichever way you uh, method that you want to, and then hopefully we can get you to where you want to be. Good luck.